Welcome to the workbench and welcome to Wheels and Wings TV. This time around, we're not working with our usual plastic. That's right, today we're working with metal. That's right, we've got our hands on Ravel's 35th anniversary tribute to the Aces High single with their 132nd scale Iron Maiden Spitfires. For those of you who aren't familiar with Iron Maiden, the song Aces High is an homage to the fighter pilots of the Royal Air Force, the legendary few of the Battle of Britain, with the Spitfire gracing the covers of the album. The band even went so far as to construct a scale replica of a Spitfire to fly over the stage of their concerts. And it is these two unique Spitfires that are the subject of this kit. The first example we have here is featured on the kit box top and is the one that graces the back cover of the Aces High single. Um, this is a Battle of Britain themed Mark I, Mark II Spitfire. Although themed around a Battle of Britain Spitfire, it doesn't depict any one particular aircraft. In fact, I believe the squadron codes DR are in reference to Derek Riggs, the artist behind most of Iron Maiden's iconic album covers. The inflatable stage prop, however, does have some interesting backstory to it. The squadron code UF is in reference to 601 County of London Squadron, with, of course, East London being the birthplace of the band. The serial number can be traced to a Spitfire flown by 302 Polish Squadron. In one interesting anecdote, the pilot that typically flew serial number AA853 stayed in England after the war and eventually was naturalized as a British citizen. He later changed his name from Vodislaw to Eddie. On a further note, AA853 also has a Canadian connection, as it was on strength with 302 Squadron when they were involved with Operation Rudder. Operation Rudder, of course, being the dress rehearsal for the infamous Dieppe Raid. Now, because we're modelers and we like to research every little detail about something, we tried to figure out exactly what variant the blow-up stage Spitfire is, and it's still open to discussion. The serial number belongs to a Mark V, however, the outward appearance of the stage prop is more resemblant of a Mark IX Spitfire with its four-bladed propeller. We have decided to be different and go with a somewhat historically authentic Mark IX-esque styled Spitfire. And if you think that a Mark IX perfectly suits the blow up one, then when you go out and get your Iron Maiden Spitfire, why not pick up Ravel's equally nice 30 second scale Mark IX and then you can have two Iron Maiden Spitfires in your collection. However, if you only get in the one kit, we are going to touch on some ways to improve it, a few things you can add, and a few problem areas to look out for. Now, before we even look at the Spitfire, we need to get Eddie all dressed up, or Eddie's, as this kit does come with two, a standing and a seated version. Now, if you plan on having the seated Eddie in the cockpit, you need to install him before the cockpit goes into the fuselage. Trust me, I found out the hard way he does not fit once the entire fuselage is put together. Construction of the two Eddie figures is very straightforward as they're only made up of a few parts each with the seams easily taken care of, a little bit of putty or a little bit of Mr. Surfacer. To make workflow easier, I would suggest leaving the Ed separate from the rest of his body until after painting. Now, we have enlisted our friend and master figure painter, Colin, to breathe some undead life into our Eddie. If you paint mostly with water-based acrylics, a wet palette like this one we have here from AK is a very good investment. A wet palette basically consists of a parchment-type paper laid over a water-soaked sponge in a container. As long as there is water in the sponge, your paint will not dry out as it continually wicks moisture through the paper. This makes blending of colors very easy and results in a lot less wasted paint as the paint is not drying on the palette as you work. Starting with the head, we're going to first block in our base and initial highlight colors, with the helmet getting some red-brown colors for the leather before we move on to the face. Unlike most 
typical figures, Eddie is, well, not really alive, so we can't use our usual flesh colors. Uh, we're going to be using shades of blue, green, and yellow for a more undead, decayed, decomposing look. We're going to set the head off to the side for now and turn our attention to the rest of the body. Uh, for a little bit of variety, we're going to mix up a slightly different leather shade for the jacket than what we used on the helmet. And of course, because Eddie is British, we are bound by law to use some Vallejo English uniform on this figure. As you can see, we're not using very small paint brushes on this figure. A larger brush with a sharp point that holds a lot of paint is more useful than a very tiny 10 or 20 zero brush. Make sure to always thin your paint and apply it in many light layers, building up color gradually. This gives you more control over the color and results in a smoother finish and a smoother transition between your shades and highlights. Try to move around the different areas of the figure as you work. This uh, keeps you from overworking any one particular area and allows the colors to come into their natural shade as these paints will fade slightly as they dry. For more control of your paint in tight areas and when doing shadows around details, add a little bit of Vallejo's glaze medium to your paint mix. Uh, this thins out the pigmentation of the color without drastically reducing the viscosity. With the jacket blocked in, we're going to turn our attention to the pants with some medium and dark blue. Now we come to the May West in one of the worst colors known to the entire modeling world, yellow. We're going to start with some pale yellow and sand colors and slowly build our way up to the final brighter yellow color. Because yellow is a very translucent color, it would take many, many coats of paint to cover up if we simply went right onto the primer. We've now mixed up an off-white color for the fleece trim around the collar and the cuffs. Very pale shades of other colors, light grays, light yellows, greens, etc. will look more realistic as nothing in the real world is ever pure white, nor does it ever stay white if it is white. If you do need a more pure white color, such as on the straps for the parachute, basing it with a very pale blue first will keep it from becoming a muddy gray. As we move on to the flying boots, the same rule as with white applies. Try to never use pure black, as nothing also is ever really pure black. Dark blues and dark grays are generally more realistic, especially at smaller scales. With all our paintwork done, we'll finish up with a final coat of flat varnish before attaching the head to the body. With our Eddie finished, it's time we crank things up to 11 and move on with our Spitfire. As usual, we're going to start with the cockpit. We're only going to attach a few of the smaller parts to the side walls before we move on to priming and painting. We'll do the rest of the assembly after painting and weathering. Everything is going to get a coat of AK's RAF interior grade green. However, the seats in the Spitfire was made out of an early resin composite and should be a reddish, brownish, orange color. Next up, we're going to add some filth to the cockpit with a little bit of AK's interior streaking grime. Now, with Eddie stuffed in the cockpit, we're probably not going to see much of all this work, but it makes for good practice anyway. The instrument panel in this kit is one of the high points and is very well rendered. The decal, however, does not quite match up with the molded detail. At this scale, however, it does not take a lot of work to do all the detailing yourself. On the other hand, you could also replace it with a photo etch instrument panel. We have a very nice one here from Yahoo. These Yahoo panels come completely assembled, so all you have to do is glue it in place. Now we can finish assembling the cockpit. 
I would recommend not gluing the control column in place until you have Eddie situated in the cockpit just to make sure that his hand is actually going to be on the control grip. You may need to remove some of Eddie's large posterior to get him to sit comfortably in the seat. Now with Eddie strapped in and ready to go, we can glue on the sidewalls, attach the cockpit to the fuselage, and bring our fuselage halves together. I would recommend not installing the tail wheel at this time to make painting easier and to avoid breaking it off. This is where our build is going to deviate from yours if you're building out of the box, is we're going to be stealing the wings out of Ravel's Mark 9 kit. That being said, general assembly is exactly the same with the landing gear bays, the upper and lower wings, the only real differences being the twin radiators of the Mark 9 versus the single large radiator on the Mark 2. If you're building your kit out of the box and want to give it more of a Mark 5 look that the blow up is based on, best thing to do is add some cannons. We have some really nice turn brass barrels here from Master. These are a relatively inexpensive addition and very easy to install. The cannons are going to locate in the exact same position as the innermost machine guns. Simply open up the existing holes until the cannon barrels fit snugly. If you don't have a drill bit large enough, simply work slowly with a round file. Coincidentally, the Tamiya file we have here was exactly the size we needed. Making sure both cannon barrels are protruding the same distance from each wing and are square to the wing, both up and down and left and right, wick in a little bit of extra thin cement to secure them in place. The next thing you want to do is to plug the second most inner machine gun as well as its corresponding ejection port under the wing. You could use putty for this, however an easier way is going to be to take some leftover plastic off the sprues and melt them into these holes with some liquid cement, let them dry and then sand them smooth. One of the problem areas of this kit to watch out for is the ailerons. Ravel have not given us any secure way to attach the ailerons to the wing. I would suggest tacking these in place with some thick super glue before flowing some medium super glue into the joint. We can now join the wings and the fuselage. The wing roots fit quite well with almost no gaps. However, where the center section of the lower wing meets the lower fuselage does not fit very well and will require filling, puttying, and reshaping. We will now attach the horizontal tails and the elevators. Unlike the ailerons, the elevators attach comparatively very securely to the horizontal tail planes. Another problematic area of this kit is the landing gear legs. Instead of being molded in a single piece, they are split into an upper and lower half. This creates a weak point on the leg which will eventually break. You could use some cast metal legs from somebody like Scale Aircraft Conversions. However, we're going to go a different route. We're simply going to reinforce the kit pieces with some brass rod. This is as simple as drilling a hole down the middle of the upper and lower parts and inserting a brass rod and using some super glue to fix it in place. You may end up with a gap between the two parts. Simply fill this with some super glue or some putty and sand it smooth when dry. Super glue would probably be the better option as this is going to add some additional strength to the landing gear leg. Now to my eye, one of the most glaring issues of accuracy with this kit is the main wheels. The ratio of the hub to the tire is way off and looks nothing like the wheels on a real Spitfire. There are many, many options for 132nd scale resin wheels for Spitfires, and we have chosen these really nice five-spoke wheels from Barracuda. Much like the cannon barrels, the wheels are an inexpensive upgrade and definitely do a lot to improve the look of this kit. Now with all of our seams taken care of, our canopy parts attached and masked off, we can get ready to start painting. We're going to do the lower surfaces and we're going to marble those up with a lighter and darker shade of gray before our final medium sea gray. We're going to be using mission model acrylics for all of our camouflage colors on this. These are a water-based paint that have almost no smell and are very safe to use especially if you have young family members or pets and you can't use your favorite lacquer paints.
We've primed the entire model and all the other parts with black as we will be following the black basing technique on this kit. Black basing simply involves applying marbled layers of color to the model before applying your final color coats. Using two to four lighter and darker shades of each color gives a random variance to each color and helps break up large areas of any one color and gives a more natural, slightly worn appearance to the paint. Now instead of having to deal with the annoyingly long, thin wing walk decals, we are going to mask these markings off. Using one of these AK cutting boards, we're going to cut some thin strips of masking tape and apply this right onto the black primer before we start doing our camouflage colors. Consulting the instructions, we're going to pencil in our camouflage pattern as we're going to be doing this all freehand. You could easily mask this off as well with some tape or a masking putty. All the colors we're using here are historically accurate for a Spitfire in the later half of the Second World War. The stage prop has some artistic license taken, so you want to follow the instructions or go off some pictures if you want to do it exactly as it appears. With painting finished, we apply a coat of gloss varnish in preparations for our decals and our eventual weathering. A gloss coat is not mandatory for doing decals, however it is a little bit more forgiving than a completely dead flat or matte finish. Either way, make sure you use some good setting solutions such as Walther Solvacet to make sure those decals snuggle down into every single panel line and rivet. Uh, take care with the underwing roundels as these do have to conform over a bulge behind the ejection port on the outermost machine guns. You are going to have to make some relief slices in the decal as well as soak these things in, in setting solution to make sure they bed down completely. Now because we're going for a more historically authentic representation, we've used some aftermarket decals here for these squadron codes as these are a bit more appropriate for in size and color than the ones in the kit. With all the decals in place, we can now begin our weathering. This part is really easy. We're simply going to take this neutral gray wash make and slather it all over the model, making sure it gets into every single panel line and rivet. After a few minutes, the wash is dry and we can scrub this off with a paper towel. Always make sure to wipe front to back so that any streaking looks natural and like you meant to. Whether you are a casual modeler, a hardcore Iron Maiden fan, or a Spitfire enthusiast looking to add an interesting variant to your collection, you should find this kit quite invaluable. The accuracy-oriented modeler will find faults with this kit. However, in the six years since it was originally released, there have been many correction and detail sets released by the aftermarket community. Whatever your opinion, there is no doubt that Ravel certainly have given us two of the most interesting variants of the Spitfire, and I know I for one definitely had fun building these two up.